Hello everyone and welcome back to another Sensei Q&A. This is the instructional series curated by you. I asked you guys on Instagram the other day what musical topics you wanted me to cover in this video and this is what you came up with. Before we get into it though, a quick word from the sponsor of today's video Skillshare, an online learning community for creators with over 25,000 classes and countless topics ranging from growing a successful YouTube channel to redesigning your wardrobe. Ever since I got my membership, every month I've been trying to make my way through a Skillshare class in an attempt to develop some new abilities. This month I'm watching a class called Digital Poster Design, in which the instructor walks you step by step through the process he uses to create the art you're seeing now. It's well done, it's engaging, it's easy to understand, and the techniques he teaches are things that I found myself applying when I go to create my YouTube thumbnails. An annual subscription is very affordable, costing less than $10 a month. To check it out, there's a link to a two month free trial in the description. All right, let's get to it. To kick things off, Dan Yates says that he's in college for music, but the passion seems lost sometimes. What can he do to get it back? I went through this exact same thing after my third year of school and saw many of my peers experience this as well. Many of them dropped out because of this. I personally stuck it out. I'll tell you what worked for me. My first three years of school were focused around jazz, which is a music that I enjoy. I see the value of learning, but it was never where my heart truly was. So after being completely surrounded by it for a few years, I was totally burnt out. On top of that, I was around many guitarists who were significantly better at the style than I was, and I didn't see how any of us can make any real money playing jazz. At this point, I strongly considered dropping out and going to law school. Ultimately though, I realized that this would always be an option, so I decided to stick it out for the last two years of music. But the difference would be, instead of working on jazz, I was only gonna work on music that I enjoyed. That summer, I wrote pop songs, learned country solos, and started messing around with the slide guitar. These are things that I love deeply, but hadn't touched for a long period of time. I came back to them with a new outlook, new tools, and got excited again. I was fortunate that the last two years of my schooling allowed me more creative control, but because of this shift and focus, the passion came back and I never became a lawyer. I don't know exactly what will work for you, Dan, but hopefully this story helps. Next up, we have user Ku Chi who asks, why does a tritone sound so bad? A tritone is the musical interval of three whole steps. If I started on an A and went up three steps to a D sharp, my A to my D sharp is a tritone. It has a very distinct and dissonant flavor to it, but I don't think that means it's necessarily intrinsically bad. For example, an A and a D sharp can be found within the chord A major seven sharp 11. And to me, that chord can sound quite nice. Now with these dissonant sounds, you have to be a bit more strategic with how you use them. So let's talk about tension and release. Tension is something like a tritone, which is unsettled or tense, whereas release is something that sounds constant or settled like this. If you had an entire song of tension, that would sound pretty abrasive, whereas if you had an entire song of release, that would sound pretty bland. A key component of music is combining these two together. So while a tritone on its own may sound bad, if you strategically use it with the appropriate release, it can sound quite pleasing. Now there is a scientific physics explanation as to why when these two waveforms interact, they sound dissonant, but I'm not gonna get into that. It's above my pay grade. And honestly, it doesn't really have anything to do with how we use it musically. Next up is Jack Conway 83, who asks how he can learn jazz chords faster. He follows up by saying, band is really hard for him right now and he's only been playing for a year. It's very important to be working on things that are within a reasonable grasp of your skill level. I'm wondering if you've only been playing for a year, should you really be working on things like complex jazz chords? Music is a skill that you develop incrementally, slowly building on the things that you've learned before. So before I would start working on four note chords or extended jazz chords, I would make sure that you've mastered the triads around the neck and all their inversions. If you aren't there yet, work your way up to these more complicated chords. A good instructor shouldn't have you working on things that are too far out of your grasp. Having said that, sometimes the school system isn't perfect, so I will try to help you out a bit. You can always simplify chords. Say I had the chord progression C major seven, A minor seven, D minor seven, and G seven. I would play that like this with full chords. But you could also simplify that so that you're only playing the notes on the B and G string. And if you're playing in a full jazz band with a lot of instruments in it, you can probably get away with this. Ask your instructor to help you find some of these options to make it more manageable and therefore more beneficial to your learning. Next up, Ludge Joe asks, how do you know if you are good on guitar? 
Well, good is a matter of perspective, so it's a tough question to answer. But one of the things that used to motivate me when I was a young Sammy G practicing as hard as I could on my Squire Strat was that one day I wanted to become a good guitarist, whatever that meant. So I worked away for years and years trying to get there, but I came to realize that I would never truly be happy with my skill level since what defined good in my mind kept moving further and further away the more time that I spent with my instrument. So instead of trying to be good, I then started focusing on expressing myself through music and making art that I thought represented me. Fortunately, I had done enough practicing leading up to this point that this was feasible. The irony is that accepting that I would probably never be a good guitarist is what led me to becoming what many would consider a good guitarist. Moving on, Gavin Carnett asks if I have any advice for turning off the theory switch in your head. He says that it's hindering his songwriting. Okay, so as counterintuitive as it may be, I think you probably need to spend a bit more time with theory, especially the ear training side of it. The goal with theoretical concepts is not to learn them so that you can force them upon your music, but rather it's to learn them so well, both orally and logically, that you don't even need to think about them, they just come out naturally. I like to use language as a metaphor. When I'm speaking to you, I don't need to think about grammatical rules or vocabulary. I've spoken enough English in my life that it just comes out naturally. I mean, I probably could break things down in terms of nouns or adjectives, but at no point do I ever do that. This is where you want to get with theory. You don't want to be thinking about what chords or notes you're using from a theoretical standpoint, but rather you want to know how they sound, you want to know what they do, and you want to be able to use these tools to recreate what you're imagining in your head. Only when you're stuck with a song might you start breaking things down from a theoretical standpoint to spark some new inspiration. So Gavin, make sure that anything you've learned from a theoretical standpoint, you can also hear in your inner ear as clear as you can see the color blue. When you're writing, it sounds like you are first and foremost trying to apply the guidelines that you've learned, which is a great place to be. But the next step is to hear everything in your inner ear and just create a simultaneous connection between that and what comes out of your guitar. And last for today, Diet Guitarist asks, what is the best way to incorporate freshly learned chords and scales into a fully realized musical idea. Well, why don't we just walk through it? Say somebody showed me this voicing for a C major 9. One of the first things I want to do is get this shape under my fingers. And to do that, I'll take this chord and play it one bar per chord around the circle of fourths. I like this exercise because it gets you jumping around the guitar neck. and so on. If I need to, I might stretch it out to two bars, three bars, even four bars, however long it takes. And as I get better, I'll shorten it down so that I'm doing two beats, even one beat on each chord. But this is only one part of the equation. I'll also want to spend some time analyzing this shape from a theoretical perspective. For example, the first note is the root note, the second note in the chord is the third, that's the major seventh, and the top note is the ninth. I know that a chord with these tones in it can be used in place of the one chord in a major scale or alternatively the four chord in a major scale. I then might try experimenting with a song that uses these chords in a progression and see what that sounds like. So here's a song that goes one, four, five, four, one. I'll use that major nine shape in place of the one and the four. Maybe I like it, maybe I don't, at least now it's an option. The other important thing that I wanna be able to do with this chord is hear it. And I'll work on that by singing through its arpeggio. Root third seven nine. Or I can try a variation on this, pick a note in the chord and see if I can sing it before playing it. I'll play the root, try to sing the major seven and then play the major seven to see how close I got. Major seven. These are the three major components you want to be working on simultaneously in some respect whenever you're working on something new. The theory, the sound, and the application. I only gave you a couple examples on how to do this, but you should be working on figuring out what works best for your style of learning. And once you've worked enough on these things, they'll start coming out naturally in your playing. Ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. I hope you found this information useful. And if you want to get involved in a future one of these, make sure you follow me over on Instagram. Remember, there is a two month free trial to Skillshare using the link in the description. Check it out. There's some really great stuff over there. To get caught up in the Sensei series, hit that link up there. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. Until next time, thank you all for watching. I'm Sam Ray Guitarist, and I will see you again soon.